and thank you for coming to the Cohen Ambassador event, The Imperative Lecture. My name is Kate Koslowski, and I've been in the organization for two years, and I'm one of the co-chairs. This is the second year that Cohen Ambassadors have been in the organization, and we have recently registered with this, to be a sponsored student organization so we get more um, recognition on campus. We have 15 students in the group, varying in different majors, and the goal of our organization is to be a resource to students, faculty, and staff by answering questions, hosting events, and volunteering at events. Now Sadia is going to talk about the imperative lecture. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sadia, as Kate mentioned. I've also uh, been in the ambassador program since it was started alongside with her. Um, I've not only had a chance to represent the business school, but also work with a great uh, group of students. All of us are wearing these fancy polos. Um, with that said, this is actually the largest event that we have planned, and so it's fabulous to see such a great turnout. I um, appreciate you all for coming. I'm going to go in and talk a little bit about why we chose this event. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with the book called The Last Lecture. It's a New York Times bestseller. Uh, we, I, I really like this book, so we decided to do a mock-up of that uh, for the professors that we have here at Columbia. Um, so this is their chance to share the wisdoms that they would impart as if this was their only lecture. Um, with that said, we are welcoming Professor Lee, Professor Trulis, and Sir Yukich to come and speak. Um, and I'm actually going to hand it off to Allison, who's going to share a little bit more. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Allison Hanley. Um, I'm a senior here. I've been in the ambassador program for both years, for two years. Um, I'm an accounting and information systems so we'll major. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So um, our first speaker is Dr. Yukich. He received his bachelor's in computer science and electrical engineering from the <coughs> University of Zagreb, Croatia, and his master's and PhD in computer science from the University of Alabama. Um, he has been teaching at Loyola for 15 years, and right now he teaches INFS 247 and 346, so some of you may have had him in class. Um, earlier this semester, he won the prestigious award of Loyola's Faculty Member of the Year, so we're very excited about that. Um, now please welcome Professor Yukich. Before I get started, I really want to thank our ambassadors. Uh, what a great group of people. Thank you for your service. I, I know most of you, many of them are in my classes, and you're the best of us. Thank you for representing our school and organizing events like that. Every time I see you on campus talking to uh, visitors, students around, it just makes me feel proud to be a part of this school. Thank you so much. Big round of applause. Yeah. I've never seen an ambassador that didn't do well after being here for a while. It's the best move to be an ambassador. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, I was told I have 15 minutes, so I only have one slide, and I'm just going to tell you what I think are essentials of being successful in school and career, at least things that worked for me. And, uh, you know, trial and error. You know, learn on my mistakes. I, um, I've seen thousands of students in my career. I've seen hundreds of phenomenally successful people. I'm so proud of uh, the students that you produce here. They, they do fantastic work in some of the world's greatest companies or startups or not-for-profits. Um, it is, it's just been a thrill to spend my 15 years here. So here's what I tell my students in my classes and I'll share that with you here, too. Um, you know, there is a, a, how many of you have seen that uh, uplifting speech by Steve Jobs that he gave at the commencement of Stanford? This, did anyone see that? You know, um, certainly very uplifting. What a tremendous man talking. I actually don't like that speech. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that, that it, can cause, as, as, as inspirational as it is, I think it, it, can find, it can cause a lot of damage. I'll explain why. And in this country in particular, we are raised to follow our dream and follow our passion wherever it takes us. <laughs> uh, you know, it sounds nice, it's a good concept, but for, statistically it doesn't work. I would not be here. If I was following my dream of playing an MBA or <laughs> appearing on Broadway or whatever, it just, it's not going to happen. 
you know, it, I don't have the right talents for it. And those are, most of us, the dreams would take us to something extremely competitive where no matter how much talent you have, no matter how good you are, it's just not going to happen. It's an equivalent to winning the lottery. I'm preaching to choir here because you are all business students here, which shows some pragmatism. But even in, in our area of, of business, there are choices to be made. I'm not saying do whatever pays the most. That's, that's not the message I'm trying to create here. I, my advice to people is to find something you're good at. You know, we all have different talents, but almost everyone is good at something. And it may not be one thing, it can be several things. Uh, hopefully, that's something that you're good at is something that can enable you to have a, what I call a life of dignity. You know, one of the reasons that I came to this country, it's not so much economic, it's not so much um, uh, excitement of the culture here and stuff. I mean, I've, I've lived in different countries. I, I found that here, I can do something that I'm, that I'm good at and just depend on that and nothing else. No connections, no family background, just meritocratic life to do. Um, if, if, but here's, here's a funny thing that happens. When you're good at something, you're going to like it too. I mean, it, it's, it's almost impossible to be good at something and, and make a living, support yourself and others around you, and to say, well, I hate this. I'm so good at it, but I don't like it. I mean, maybe, but, but it's, it's not very likely. You know? So, and there's probably, most of us are good at many things. We're not limited to just one thing. Oh, I'm only good in, I don't know, international accounting and nothing else. Probably not. Nothing against that, that's probably also something to be good at. But if, if you realize what are, what are those things that you're good at, there's probably a number of good options within those fields that allow you, I mean, you know, there, there are realities out there. Certain things are more competitive, certain things are less. Certain things pay more, certain things pay less. If you have several things that you're good at, then you can make good choices. So that would be one essential for life that I find. You know, this is one man's opinion. You know, I'm not here telling you, here is how it is, you know, and this is just my personal observations based on watching literally thousands of people like you come through my more than 20 years of teaching and seeing who was successful and where. Next advice I would give, seems self-evident, but I still think it's worth mentioning is be a nice person. I, I will do a plug, and um, in February we'll have a speaker here. His name is Rex Hopke, and maybe some of you know him. He's a writer for business section of Chicago Tribune, and I talked to him, and he agreed to come and talk, give a seminar. And he says, my whole life, my advice, my business workplace advice is be a nice person. I agree with it 100%. What does it mean to be a nice person? You know, don't be sneaky. Don't don't work behind people's back. Don't be grumpy. Don't be angry. You know, I need to give this advice to myself every day. This is a, this is a much easier advice to give than to uh, implement faithfully every day. But try. Don't be angry. By all means, don't be pompous, flaky, etc. There, there are many different ways in which you can not be a nice person. These are just some of some of the uh, things that will torpedo you in life eventually, and that you will, if you have one of these properties perpetually, they will come out, and people will notice and talk behind you. Uh, on the other hand, everybody likes a nice person. Everybody likes a nice co-worker. I've done a number of interviews in my life. I interviewed other people. I work in industry. I work in academia. And I can tell. When I see a student who is happy, open, confident, willing to help others, just what we call a nice person. I know. This person is just going to get so many more job offers than anyone else. Because everybody likes a nice person. 
much more than these types of properties. It's a business skill. It's not just good life skill and good spouse material and whatnot. It's, <laughs> it, it is, it's gonna make you successful. Um, in my experience, and by, again, observing many, many other people, hard and smart work and follow through almost always pay off. Those are phenomenal characteristics to have. Uh, hard work alone is not enough. I mean, you, you could work super hard on something which is getting you nowhere. Or uh, it's just not a good use of your time. So you do have to prioritize and figure out what do you need to work hard on. But those things that you do have to work on hard, you do have to work hard. There is there's very little substitute for hard work in life. At least from what I've seen. You know, every once in a while, people get lucky. People, they're usually in this second bullet under not nice person. <laughs> uh, the book that I always recommend to everyone, that I, that I think is a great book on human failure in business and, and very bad moral compass uh, uh, directions is uh, <coughs> a book called The Smartest Guys in the Room about the failure of Enron. That book is just a fantastic cast of characters. And some of them were not nice people. They didn't work hard. They still made hundreds of millions of dollars and they got away free. First of all, that is extremely rare. Secondly, most humans couldn't sleep at night. But it is very rare. And it, it, this is not, I, I tell every young person to read it to learn other people's mistakes and to, but to also understand that there's more to life than success at all cost. First of all, if you try it, you're probably not gonna succeed. You'll, you're more likely to end up in jail or being shunned by society. But just because few people made it, it's just not a good idea. Th these are much better uh, options for you. <coughs> Follow through is just as important as anything else. I evaluate my students all the time. I'm always on the lookout for talent. I'm always looking. You know, companies always ask me for people. And one of the characteristics that, that really tells you a lot about a person is follow through. Did they answer my email? Did, did they uh, come through with what we were supposed to? Uh, this is actually uh, not as common of a characteristic in life as you would think. I wish it was. I mean, you look at these, all these grown-ups, all these successful professionals, or so they appear so. You know, I, I, this is one of the things that I wish there was more of in life. Try to be a person that follows through. And actually, which leads me to this. Follow through means do what you said you would do. If you say you would do something, then do it. You know, there, um, I often, you know, I get involved in projects and, and sometimes, you know, here's another project that seems more interesting. I don't abandon things because it would violate my bullet points. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you say you would do something, then do it. Try to, uh, you know, there was a great quote in the Tribune the other day. I mean, um, your word and your reputation is all you got. I mean, if, if you, these are the, if you don't do what you said you would do, if you don't follow through, those are the ways to undermine your credibility. And then people will think you're not in the world too. As, you know, it, it can demote you in people's eyes. Mm -hmm. When it comes to presentations, um, and this is a very important thing. Almost all of you will present things. You know, some of you may end up being teachers. Some of you will have to present for a living. You will be um, public speaking and presentation is a fact of life, especially for business people. Very, I, I got this advice very early in my career. And it's one of the best things I've ever heard. Talk about what you know. Because when you're making a PowerPoint presentation, okay, this is something simple, but you know, you may have to make other slides and stuff. Don't ever put anything on a slide that you're not 
knowledgeable about it. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like common sense? <laughs> I go to so many conferences and presentations. More, like, more often than not, I hear a person, you can tell, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm like, who made you put this bullet on? <laughs> Where's this bullet God that says, this must be here? <laughs> and then you're like, let me, they're reading off the slide, they're looking at their note cards. Look, put one bullet on if that's all you know. Just talk about that one thing that you know about. You know, you don't... Um, at my first job interview, that was for serious job, I was all... Uh, I went straight to school, so I already had my, I was finishing my PhD and I got all prepared, this company was very prestigious, and I, I still thought I would, get a, that would be a teacher, but I still wanted to do a good job and I prepared myself. And then the guy, the first question was, tell us about your research. I'm like, this is going to be very easy. <laughs> Because there's no way you know anything about it, and I know everything about it. So I just rambled on for a half hour, and they're like, okay, I mean, when you're in a position to talk about what you know, you're in the best position there is. Now, when you're presenting, you're making your own presentation. So, you put, talk about what you know confidently. Now, um, Another advice that I like to give my students is, if somebody asks you about something you don't know, you know what's the best answer? I don't know. That is a much better answer than, or, I don't know, but I'm sure I could learn it easily. Or, I don't know, but I would love to know more about it. That is much better than fumbling and mumbling. In, in my field, this is extremely common. I mean, information technology, there's a lot of snake oil people in our field, and terminology changes all the time, and every, everyone is, there's a lot of posture, there's a lot of, hey, do you guys do anything with Hadoop? And they're like, hmm. Now everyone, no one's going to admit they don't know what, I, I've been at conferences with 100 people in the room, I, I don't think a single person knows what this word is. Including <laughs> <laughs> the one on, on the, on the stage. <laughs> Actually, my, my, one of my favorite um, memories from early going to the conferences, I used to be a lot more naive. I used to think everyone knows everything. I used to think everyone read these poets. So my early, one of the early areas of research that I was interested in was data warehousing. Now I teach a class, I wrote a book about it. Uh, I know, now I know quite a lot about it, but I didn't at first. So I went to this conference and there was a session on data warehousing. There was this PhD student presenting something about corporate adoption of data warehouses. And this was very early. Data warehousing is a relatively new field. So I'm like, oh, I'm so eager to hear this. This is going to be awesome. And this is from one of the top PhD programs in the country, a very famous public university that I won't mention because it's going to be very embarrassing now for me. <laughs> corporate adoption of data warehouses. So this guy puts these nice shiny slides and says, we will discuss now, we have interviewed 20 Fortune 500 companies about what they do with data. And, and I innocently raised my hand and I said, for the sake of the audience, because this is a very new field, could you start by defining what is a data warehouse? And the guy just stared at me like, uh, well, that's not the topic. <laughs> it's not a technical paper. Uh, you know, this our, our focus was not on what are, I mean, he was basically saying, I don't know what a data warehouse is. <laughs> Which he doesn't. I don't think he knows to this day what it is. <laughs> this was one of those papers. I heard the term. I'll do some surveys about it. It'll sound great. Uh, replace data warehouse with big data. That's, that's the newest term. I go to a lot of conferences, and this is yet another time that people usually don't know what they're talking about, but they're in a rush to talk about it. If you're going to talk about it, if you're going to present something, I suggest educate yourself. Don't talk about what you don't know. It's, you can get to a point, again, where you can undermine your career. 
You control the agenda when you're presenting. Uh, I'll finish with last two points is, this works at least for me. Anyone who has ever been in a class or ever been on a committee with me, I, I, I can't be too serious for too long. It's just not my nature. And it has worked very well for me. Don't take yourself too seriously. Nobody else does. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I learned about the world after being around for a little longer. You know, of course you should be ambitious, you should try hard, you should do your best, work hard, follow through, but have a sense of humor and have a sense of perspective. Almost nothing is the end of the world. You know, unless you have some serious family, medical problems, etc. Everything else is just crazy. If you are relaxed about things, I tell people, job interview, it's not the end of the world. A career, grade, it's, it's, success and failure comes in life. Uh, there will be ups and downs. It's much easier to deal with it if you just don't take yourself when you take yourself too seriously, you're also, you know, treading on this. <laughs> um, and, you know, humor can diffuse attention, and it's more fun. I mean, you know, people can listen to you for 10 minutes, you know, and then you, you gotta crack a joke or something. <laughs> I check out after 10 minutes. <laughs> and finally, my last advice is, Take a day. <laughs> <laughs> this, is not, this may sound very self-serving. <laughs> there are some administrators here, colleagues, truck. We don't get paid a penny extra if we have more or less people in our classes. This is not, you know, I you know. But for you who are business students and all of you are, I have never seen a major that's not going to really advance their career by taking a database class. We have a wonderful undergraduate database class which will teach you, and many of you have taken it. I see half of you here, some of you in, in my class, but it will add, today's world, today's world of business is a data-driven business. And that's just it. There, there's no question about it. There's no debate about it. It, it. It's just what it is. And you don't have to be an IS major, any major, HR, accounting, marketing, you will deal with data, and here at Loyola you have a unique opportunity to become what I like to say, data connoisseur, or data whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> you will get data. I mean, dealing with data, what we teach in our database class, SQL, um, uh, data modeling, etc. This, this used to be something specific to people. This is like Excel was 20 years ago. They run out, it's over. I mean, can you get a professional job and say, you know, I don't know Excel. Very difficult. Uh, more and more is demanded of you as young professionals entering out there and dealing with data, understanding data, really being comfortable with it is, is a must. And many, Look, schools are understanding this, and, and but we we are good at it. This is one of our. This is the competitive advantage that we give you out there in the market. So, those were my short essential. I hope I was on time, and I'm going to now. I'm going to ask for everyone to hold on for questions until later, or we're going to have a chance to eat, um, and you guys can meet everyone that's here tonight. Um, that was lovely. No? Another round of applause. I really am grateful to the ambassadors for the invitation. It always means a great deal to me when students invite me to these things. I'm very touched. I mean it. And, um, it's high, high accolade indeed to be the, the only Czech. Esteemed <laughs> <laughs> colleagues, really, truly, it means a, a great deal that um, I'm in this 
group of company. Um, gentlemen, I salute you. Um, I don't have the dignity and grace of my colleague tonight. I am more of a glass chewing Balkan creature, right? Um, but I am a woman, the mother of all mothers, actually. And so my advice is going to be a little softer. My advice is a little more humanistic, it's a little less serious, it's a little less about business, and a whole lot more just about life. And it's important for me to start this out um, by telling you that I'm a product of Loyola Chicago. And I get kind of, you know, weepy when I think about you guys. And my own two idiots that are studying here as well. <laughs> my four here. This place taught me a great deal. Um, it taught me um, how to think, how to write, and how to stand up for those that can't stand up for themselves. And that to me is the cornerstone of a social justice, Jesuit education. So don't take those things lightly. And focus as much of your energy to the curriculum and the classes that enable and channel that concept of social justice in your personal and your professional lives. Because when it's all said and done, and you're being taken to the cemetery, you're not going to woefully regret that the money you didn't make or the promotion that you didn't get, OK? You might, God bless you, that was cute. You might, <laughs> you might regret not knowing yourself really intimately and honestly and not knowing everyone around you. You know, it's not just because some dead Greek told us to know ourselves. It's about really, you know, the adventure, the journey of your lives and, and not getting so consumed by the stages and being a little more flexible and, and looking at the people around you and getting to know them as well. Because, you know, life is a series of exchanges, and you never know the stranger that you're going to meet might just be an angel that enables a dream. And it's happened to me over and over again in my life. And sometimes the most innocuous, um, ridiculous corners of your life open up extraordinary opportunities. Um, be open to them. You know, be smart enough to be lucky, and be wise enough to take pause and know what's going on around you. Um, because part of knowing yourself is also knowing when to settle. And in life, love, or work, knowing when to settle is sort of the elixir of compromise. And we live in a very polemic world. You kids have been weaned and raised in an environment of profound sort of polemic politics and economics and you know, these cultural and economic and political divides. It's us against them. It's the physical world, the economic world, the natural world. You know, life's not quite that black and white. It's much more hued and textured and grayscale. So compromise is an important thing in business especially. You're going to constantly be dealing with people you'd rather not be dealing with. Um, but knowing how to negotiate with people is an important characteristic. And it's equally important to know how to fail and not fear pain. Not just because you won't be able to fully appreciate pleasure, right? but not fearing pain and failure is an important part of your character building. It builds character when nobody's around and looking. You know, sometimes those, those worst, worst, worst things, you can't even imagine how you're going to survive on, right? You do. You always do. And they'll build your character and make you stronger as a consequence, I think. I mean, again, what the hell do I know? I mean, these are my <laughs> sort of life experiences. This is what my life has taught me and has enabled for me. Um, and I wish I had learned this when I was your age, because I didn't. Learning importance of solitude. Learn the importance of taking 15 or 20 minutes out of cacophonous, really busy days and just breathe and take it all in. And ponder the great universal or cosmic questions of the dead. Or really, like, I'm going to settle 10 minutes tonight to think about the fact that man just used a harpoon and nails and landed on a comet. That sounds like wild stuff. Okay. <laughs> or that Google has an army of robots that they're preparing for battle in a NASA research plant. These are important things, and sometimes you know it can be as heady as that, or it can be, you know, what do I want to eat tomorrow? Okay? Just breathing is important. The pace of life is so fast, so cacophonous. You know, slowing down is, is relevant. And I didn't do it early enough in my life. I wish I had. I wish, I hope my kids listen to me on that one. That was important. This one is my very, very favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you all take it to heart. Because you don't sleep enough. 
study after study after study oh, validates that we don't sleep enough. We just don't sleep enough. And the endorphins are running at different levels at your age versus at my age. You know, that's why old, we're old and we get up at five. It's our body clock to getting us ready for death. We just sleep less and less. Come on, got stuff to do. <laughs> Serotonin's peak at like yeah, right? Just don't sleep. I mean, I could sleep right here, right now. I could go into an empty and sleep right now. But it's important, okay? I mean, yeah. um, embrace randomness, paradox, and change. Um, I'm a big, big sort of fangirl groupie of Nassim Taleb. I would advise and recommend that you read all of his books, from *The Bed for Crucis* to *Antifragile* to *The Black Swan*. Go out right now and buy yourself some Taleb because. What Talib is basically telling us is that the world is going to constantly be changing. The only constant in business is change. And you can count on that. You can count on very few things in business, but you can count on change. So embrace it. Be ready. Be flexible. You know, your generation is going to go through eight or 12 careers, they're projecting. You're going to have to adapt to entirely new chemistries and entirely new global realities. So randomness is important. And change and flexibility should be your friend and not your foe. Um, never underestimate the stupidity of other people. Okay. Or the most universal human emotion, which is greed. Um, we all have it. We temper it, you know, to some extent. But never underestimate, in business especially, and I'm a marketer. I mean, I grew up in the agency world, which was not a, a world of nice people. Um, <clears throat> it was a, a world of great creativity and great spontaneity and, you know, great, um, Great fun in the 80s. But that was a long, long time ago when dinosaurs fought the earth and we actually had budgets. And we could produce things that were creative and wild and experimental. Just never underestimate and trust your radar. This one is really about trusting your instincts and remembering what your mother and father taught you. Because if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't smell right, if it doesn't act right, it probably isn't right. So just kind of protect yourselves a little bit. Protect yourselves a little bit. Professor Benton. I know. <laughs> I haven't seen this many people in class. <laughs> that was great. Um, <laughs> 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 you look like Indiana Jones too. Surround yourself with simple things and complicated people. I think we've seen the consequences of that in our global economy. You know, a little bit, a little too much McMansion going on. Um, big fat houses that were empty and we couldn't finish them with cartoon shaped furniture from Pottery Barn um, because we over reached ourselves. But just like simple, simple stuff. Simple stuff, complicated people. People that you can argue with, people you debate with, people that it make you better. You know, there's an expression in Greek, my mother used to chant it like a monk when I was a child. Show me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. I'm sure all of you have some manifestation of that in your own upbringing. You just surround yourself by hip, cool people that make you more interesting and challenge your opinions, okay? Learn how to eat right. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. <laughs> Seriously. You know, learn to cook early. Learn good olive oil. Learn about good cheese. I mean, cheese that like smells so bad, you can't bring it in your house. It ruins your luggage when you smuggle it in. It's a bad, stinky cheese that's so good. Okay? It's, just, it's like one of my personal things about young people. Learn the importance of food. You know, growing up, my children and my husband would ask them, we each asked them the same question when they come from school. I would ask them, you know, so George, what was the best question you asked today, son? And he would tell me some nonsense about his school day. Nico? What did you eat today? <laughs> I mean, it's like critical. It's important. It's your temple. It's your body. Feed it well. Nourish it with sleep and good food. Okay? Promise? Okay. Um, that's the mother in me. Give back um, any way and as often as you can. Giving back to society, to each other, to your communities, to your school isn't a financial thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a state of mind. It's about, you know, remembering the gifts that we've been endowed with and giving back. You know, with great, great gifts come responsibilities. And we're going to need more and more of you bright, young, effervescent people to go out into the world and make a difference. But giving back is you know, one way of doing it. And standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves. I started it out by saying that's, to me, the cornerstone of the Jesuit education. You know, I learned about liberation theology on the Lakeshore campus when I was 18 years old. And next week, I think it is, is Father Sorvino's being honored here on campus. 
um, for his work in Latin America. My voice is cracking. Does anybody else hear that? <laughs> it's a, I'm very emotional. I'm very touched by all your faces. Um, it's a cool thing, the, the education and the underpinnings that you're getting here. The big advocate of it. So stand up for those who can't. Because the voices of corporations and the voices of governments and the voices of celebrities and Kim Kardashian, we hear enough about them. We need you as young people to stand up and share your voices and your stories and what you believe in. Because I think you are going to make the 50s look like the 60s, or the 60s look like the 50s. I think your generation is going to bring in the next enlightenment, because you have to. Because we've left you such a tornado and such a tarnished inheritance, you guys are going to have to repair it. In the same way my parents fought off fascism, every generation inherits something bad. But you guys have to stand out for what's right, what's moral. And your business education can help you do that, I think. Because as much as business is always you know, maligned as the disease, it's also the cure to a lot of what ails society in the future. So that, to me, is what you kids represent. And I get really kind of worked up about it. Because I live among you. You got to grow up with that. I have four of my own that are your age. So I hear their fears and their anxieties all the time over good food and good cheese, OK? <laughs> um, respect and preserve the earth. I think that just stands on its own. I don't have to add anything to it. You know, it's important. It's scientific. You know, it's proven. The Chinese and the Americans sign comprehensive climate emissions trade agreements today. We'll see what happens, but the point is it's legitimate, OK? This is something that your generation is also going to have to deal with. Um, read voraciously every day, anything you can get your hands on. Read good books. Read the Western and Eastern canon. You know, buy yourself a Bible. Buy yourself a Quran. Buy yourself the Talmud. Read this stuff. Understand it and build a whole library. Because you can all with your like pads and your digital everything, and you sell back your books for 67 cents. You pay 194. Build a whole library. You know, they're friends. <laughs> I go back and look at the books I read as a young woman. I'm like, oh wow, wow. Right. Google's still around. It's cool. Build a library. It doesn't have to only be sort of the business books, you know? It's stuff that, you know, that feeds your spirit. Um, be grateful, be gracious, and graceful in all things. And defeat and victory, you know? I'm really, personally, I'm a child of a different generation, so I get a little, you know, infuriated with these football players high-fiving each other after they make a goal, and it's all about this sort of narcissistic look at me. It's like, you know what? <clears throat> it's the athlete, or the starlet, or the theatrical performer or the great chef or the great business person has a little bit of humility about them that we tend to remember a little more. So grace in all things is important. Um, never forget that victory has a thousand fathers, but uh, defeats an orphan. Great, great quote in the political realm is Kennedy. Never forget that <clears throat> because everyone will want credit but there's no I in team. And we live in this sort of narcissistic world today, and um, you see it manifest and transitioning into the business world. So remember, we're all in this together. We all have contributions to make. We all have something to learn from each other. Um, save money, earn it now. 10 bucks a week, I don't care what it is. Score money away. <clears throat> because there isn't going to be social security for you. Because it's going to be all gone by 2030. Okay? <laughs> save money. Learn to save money. You challenge yourself with an exercise. My poor students that are here have to hear it again. But challenge yourself with this really simple exercise. Don't use your credit card or your debit card for a week. See what it's like to go into the market with greenbacks, good old fashioned cash. And see how your consumer habits change. See what you don't buy. And ask yourself, do I need or do I want? And start being honest with yourselves and really, really question you know, the blurring of that line between needs and wants. Save money, okay? You don't know what life's going to bring you, because you guys may live to be 120. Another projection. You're going to live longer than any generation in history. Um, learn a second language. For all of you that are globalists and I want to go and work abroad, and I hear that all the time from my students. I want to work in Paris, but so do I, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, learn a second language. It's important, you know, for your own synapses and your own sort of brain development. And you can do it. It's one of my big laments about the American school system, K through 12. We don't, you know, really infuse language early enough in fluency. So, you know, go get a Rosetta Stone. Ask mom and dad to get you one for Christmas and play with it, you know? Um, most important for me, absolutely most important, don't live a life that compromises your values. Never live a life that compromises your values. And for too long, I did. And in my 50s, I unchained myself from a lot of stuff. 
that it confined my values, and it feels really good. It feels really good. I make excuses. You know, one more year at this job, one more year doing this, one more year, one more year, one more year, and then you wake up and you're 50. Just don't compromise what you believe in. You're going to compromise a lot of other things, and that's okay. We all do. Don't compromise your values because they won't sit well with your soul. And then you'll become like the NASA, one of those moon people. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> okay? <coughs> um, success is measured in, by achieving in adulthood the dream you cultivated in your adolescence. That's one of my favorite lines from Dalib's book. And sort of I feel that that's my definition of success. Because when I was a young girl your age, <clears throat> this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach. This was my ambition. If you had told me back then, that I was going to be teaching here, that I was going to marry my college sweetheart, that we were going to have four kids together, I'd be like, yeah, right. But it all kind of worked out. And the journey was circuitous, and it took me into you know, chapters and passages and private little worlds I didn't anticipate, but it got me here. So that, to me, is the measure of success that I achieved as an older woman, what I jumped about as a younger one. Um, stay curious and compassionate, and be courageous. You know, be courageous. That's all. Don't be timid. We've institutionalized a lot of things about the world your kids have inherited. And we've you know, made you timid. But be courageous and, and embrace, um, you know, my fondest aspiration for all of you comes from the Hellenistic Age. It's a wonderfully simple trinity of questioning everything, adhering to nothing, and creating something. That's what the Hellenists <coughs> lived their life by. God bless you and, and aspire to. You know, if you question things and adhere to nothing, but create something, from that chaotic state, great things can be spawned so that you too can ultimately go off and set the world ablaze. Because that's our responsibility and, and yours collectively. You know, we're in a partnership on this one together. So um, I'm flush, but I had fun. I hope that helped. Thank you. <laughs>
before you guys, right? And so I started to think, well, where did I get my advice and maybe what advice have I given? And so I thought a little bit about this. Um, and I thought about my dad. He never gave me any advice, <laughs> none, um, because he modeled it. He worked his tail off. Came to this country, worked his tail off, found my mom back in Ireland, brought her here. She did the same thing. They didn't sit me down and we didn't have the dinners that I try to have now with my kids and impart wisdom and advice and all that kind of stuff. He just worked. And there's something to be said about that. So not a lot of words to talk about there that he gave me, but I thought, all right, something there. But I got to tell you something else. So I thought about like Yoda. That's some great advice that he's historically given, right? Do or not do, there is no try. That seemed pretty deep, but it's Yoda, and it's kind of fake. So I didn't think that was it. I thought a little bit of the advice that I kind of give my kids. I have uh, two teenage daughters, and um, I think if I said the first two words of this next thing, they could repeat it. They could repeat it in their sleep. And I always say, if you can't be good, be better. And so I don't know what that really means, but it was kind of cute when they were young, and they keep saying it and we keep talking about it. But not a lot to put around behind that. Some other advice I gave him, I said, hey, no tattoo drummer. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, um, but that's not advice that I can kind of give you because, I don't know, I just, I just can't. So, again, I'm searching a little bit. I'm, I'm pacing for the last couple of days. I have not slept very well. I can stand in front of anybody and talk about accounting, right? And in fact, you talked about advice of getting sleep. I know some of you have caught some naps in my class as I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, uh, I don't know. Nanad said something about, you know, find what you're good at. I finally did here. I think I'm good at it. I enjoy it. I really have a lot of fun with it. And, um, but, you know, it's, it's uh, where else is this advice, right? This is, this is tough. This was tough for me. I sell for a living, you know, mentioned that I'm, I do some other stuff. I get in front of big corporations regularly. Next Tuesday I'm in Jersey, Thursday I'm in Jersey for a day we're presenting, we're in the final four. I love that stuff. I think a lot of the advice that both of them gave you is stuff, I didn't know I'd do that, but boy, I feel pretty good about myself because I do do that. I think people, customers I see, think I'm trustworthy. And it's not because I'm trying to be, you know, and saying I'm trustworthy, I'm demonstrating that. And I think that's a big, big deal. So again, how do I find some advice and think a little bit? And I'm stressing over this. And so I'm, you know, I see even Matthew McConaughey is like giving advice, like the 10 moments that changed my life. And at the supermarket checking out, and there he is staring at me with a shirt on. And I'm thinking, come on, how is this going to. So then, of course, I always find, calm down with the beer. And so there's this beer, and it says, you will never get back to five seconds. <laughs> where, is this, where is this advice? Like, where and what can I do? And so it just, I, I, I got to tell you, God's honest truth, it's been three days of kind of waking up in the middle of the night. I kind of went for a long walk last night, thinking a little bit about this. And I had a big presentation, I just kept throwing it away. And, and kind of rewriting it. Um, and I think I kind of came down to a couple of things. So, listen. Not necessarily to me, right? But listen. Kind of be in that moment. Hear stuff. You know, we're all talking about advice we wish we, wish we had given our younger selves. Man, I'm much better when I just shut up once in a while. I really am. You probably, some of you who sit in my classes don't know that, right? Because all I do is talk, right? Um, but I think it's really important to just shut up once in a while. Hear what the other person is saying. Hear what's out there. Hear the quiet. It's kind of nice sometimes. And it's that ability to kind of listen, to truly listen. There's so much noise, so much noise. I make it. My wife makes it. My kids make it. TV, there's so much noise, and you've got to filter through all that stuff. You will do well in life if you can figure out what the core points are. Again, I sell, and what I ask, and I put together 100-page presentations of stuff I know and know cold, 
and I walk into most of the presentations that I give, like I will this Tuesday, or next Thursday, I should say. I probably should book the flight. <laughs> I don't know, there's something else that's gonna pop up. But I think it's really important to kind of stand, and I stand in front of these folks, and I want to hear what your issues are. I'm not here because I'm smarter than the other guys. I'm not here because we're a better firm than the other guy. I'm here because you have an issue, and I want to understand what that is, right? Are you looking for a better price? Then I can address that one way. Are you looking for better service? Then I can address, address it a different way. So I really take the time. And it's taken me a long time. My wife would say, never listen. And she's probably right, unfortunately. So I got to do a better job of that at home. But I do think it's incredibly important to just shut up once in a while and listen. Really hear what the other person is saying. Really hear what is out there. That will make you better. That will make you better. So I think that's an important one. I also think this. You are your experiences. I don't care if you have a 4 on. Don't tell my daughter. All right? Um, I don't. What I care about is, are you that nice person that I want to work with? I'm going to spend way more time with you than my family, right? I better like you. I better like you. Life's too short. I've worked with a lot of torturous people in, in my past, no doubt about it. I'm fortunate right now. I don't have to do that. I can walk away. You won't have that benefit early on. And you've got to figure out how to extricate yourself from those types of things. But you are your experiences, and that's what I would hire. And that's what people will hire. Not your GPA, not who you know. I can get you in the door of some places. That's what I say to my kids. But that's it. So somebody's going to help you along the way. That's wonderful. If they can, that's awesome. But the fact of the matter is, you've got to prove yourself. You have to, have to, have to show that you belong there. And the best way to do that is through your experiences. All right? It's what you know. It's who you know. It's how you make decisions. People are going to pay you for that. That's where you're going to find some success in the business world. They're paying you not because you can do a balance sheet better than somebody else. Boy, oh boy, that would be torturous to do that all your life. It really would be awful. But what you have to figure out is how can you take that and use that knowledge to do something great to help businesses, to help organizations, whatever it might be. It's about accumulating those experiences in the most weirdest places. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Gather those experiences because that's what makes you. So go out, do stuff, do different stuff. Put yourself in weird places that you wouldn't necessarily go. Come to lectures like this. This is awesome. I'm so glad I came to this. Right? There was a point there when the flash drive wasn't working and I'm thinking like, hmm, I wonder what excuse I can set. But you, the fact that you're doing this is wonderful. Keep doing those things because it is incredible that you can do that. It really is. It's incredible to have those opportunities. And something might stick. It might. You know, as a teenager in college, not a lot of stuff stuck. Um, but it's coming back to me. And it has come back to me. And I think that's incredibly important. The more you can stick in there, eventually some of that will become incredibly valuable. All right? So I really do think you are your experiences. So make them worthwhile. Do as much as you can. It's a great world out there. So I kind of need your help. I need your help a little bit. Um, a couple of things that I kind of jotted down as I was uh, listening to my esteemed colleagues, and I'm fortunate to say uh, they are my colleagues. I'm so fortunate to be here amongst all of you. It is great, man. It really excites me when somebody asks a question in the class. It blows me away, because sometimes there are incredible questions. Even the bad questions are pretty good. Because somebody's <laughs> starting to think a little bit. And I love that. And so to questioning everything. I think that's really, really exciting to me. So I think, you know, I jotted down a couple of things. Whatever you do, do it well. Right? Care. Care. If you're going to show up, care. All right? And I need your help because i got to do that. Right? Sometimes I'm running late for that class, and boy, oh boy, I'm a couple of minutes into it, and I'm really mad at myself. Because I didn't care enough to get there earlier, to get there on time, to give you what you deserve, to show you how it matters to me. Well, that's terrible. And I've got to do a better job on that. So 
when I'm late for class, let me know. Right? And don't feel ashamed by that. You're paying for this. And I want to be there, and i got to be better. But you get lazy. Right? Or you get tied up in the million things and the complexities that we have as our world. They pull us the wrong way. You've got to care and care about what matters. You're here. You spend a lot of money, somebody's money, right? <laughs> care, really care. Accounting, who wants to be an accountant? Not this guy, I'm not anymore. But I teach it, and I think there's an opportunity, whatever your function is, that this matters. That database matters, right? That marketing matters, that all of these subjects matter somehow. Your job is to figure out how it matters to you. So care, care about that. It is incredibly important. And I'm going to put my last point up there. Sell. <clears throat> Sell. You are always selling yourself. Always. Always. Every interaction. I think we all get lazy about that. But it's every interaction. The fact of the matter is, sell. Sell yourself. Sell your experiences. You have to have that idea, that aura of you, that you want to close the deal. You want that job. You want that grade. You want to meet that person. You want that experience. You want to learn those things. And the only way to do that is to sell. You are always going to be selling. If you're an HR major, you will sell. If you're a sports management major or a marketing major, you will sell. You will always sell. I'm an accountant, or foreign accountant, that sells, right? You will always be selling. Had I had those experiences, had I had that understanding, I think, earlier in my life, I think I would have moved up the ladder faster. I think I would have uh, uh, found more opportunities for myself. And it took me a long, long time. It took me a long, long time, probably into my 30s, to realize it's not just what you know. It really is how you present it, for presenting well. It really is how you are able to have knowledge, know something of value. And it really is about selling that. There's value there. You have it. Continue to grow on that stuff. And I thank you for the opportunity. Well, I appreciate it. Wow, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Now I am getting sleep tonight. <laughs> Meet the speakers, but let's give one more round of applause to the fabulous.